at the uh, Uni uh, Universidad Computense de Madrid. Um, and in parallel, actually, with her physics studies, she was also uh, becoming a conservatory trained violinist, I just learned. Um, so, uh, but we're very fortunate that Leticia decided to um, focus her efforts on, on physics thereafter. She did her um, PhD at the ENS Paris in Christophe Salomon's group, and then went on to do postdoctoral work um, in Tillman Esslinger's group at ETH Zurich. Um, and in her postdoctoral work, she really significantly advanced um, the field of uh, quantum simulation with ultra cold atoms and optical lattices. Um, for example, making the first artificial graphene lattice, realizing the topological Haldane model, um, and doing some of the pioneering studies of Fermi Hubbard physics with uh, fermions and optical lattices. Um, so she then did a brief stint as a junior CNRS researcher um, at the Institut d'Optique in Bordeaux um, before starting her group in Barcelona in 2013. Um, and so in her own research group at ICFO, she has done uh, groundbreaking experiments on um, the physics of liquid droplets and Bose-Bose mixtures. Um, she's received numerous awards, um, including the L'Oreal UNESCO Spanish Prize for Women in Science, um, the uh, Young Experimental Physics Award of the Royal Spanish Physical Society, and um, in 2016, she became a Ramon y Cajal Fellow. Um, so today we'll hear her um, tell about some of her most recent work on chiral interactions in optically coupled Bose-Einstein condensates. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Leticia. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Monica, for the introduction, and also thanks uh, very much for the invitation uh, to present our work uh, into the VAMOS seminar, which is a seminar we all like very much in my group and try to follow despite the time difference uh, between Spain and the US. Uh, so today I will be talking about uh, chiral systems, the fact that nature distinguishes left from right, as you can see in this uh, nice uh, background image that I found, so credit uh, goes to NASA, not to us for preparing such a nice uh, image where you see chirality in nature, in galaxies, also in the um, weather in the Earth, and also in molecules. But I will be talking about chirality in AMO and how um, Bose-Einstein condensates uh, can be used to explore new types of chirality, in particular chiral interactions. And I will show you how we can use them to engineer new types of solitons, chiral solitons, and also density-dependent gauge fields. And all the data that I will be showing today is extremely uh, new. So we have been working on this chirality project for quite some time now. But uh, every single plot that I will show today has been taken um, after the lockdown uh, that uh, we were forced to have in Spain due to the pandemic. So as I said, uh, nature understands the difference between uh, left and right uh, symmetry. So if you look at the weather, uh, you see that you have cyclones and that depending whether you are in the north or the south hemisphere, they turn in one direction or the other. This is due to the rotation of the Earth. But also if you put electrons in a magnetic field, they uh, experience a Lorentz force and they turn in one direction, not in the other one. And uh, we are alive because uh, uh, DNA encodes uh, our genetic sequence. And uh, DNA, for example, also has some preferred helicity. And actually, uh, the technical uh, word for this difference between left and right uh, in physics is due to uh, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, from uh, the end of the 19th century. He coined the term chiral that I learned while preparing this talk comes from the Greek word for hand, because uh, actually hands are the best example of something uh, chiral that you have at hand. So basically uh, your left hand is different from your right hand and you cannot superimpose them uh, together. And um, uh, actually one is a mirror image of the other. Yeah? So I will be talking in this VAMOS series. So I will be talking about AMO systems and of course, one of the best examples of chirality in uh, nature comes from the fact that organic molecules, they exist in one form or often it's mirror one and it's never so clear why nature chooses one or the other. But I will not be talking about that, but about chirality in engineered AMO systems. Um, and there have been really uh, great examples over the last uh, few years on how you can use these engineered AMO systems to study new types of chirality from experiments in chiral quantum optics, where basically when you have uh, nanophotonic structures, the emission 
um, of the light uh, can be happening on one direction for one polarization and the opposite direction for the other polarization. Uh, John has beautiful examples of chirality in uh, his uh, artificial photonic materials, as uh, he calls them, but also there have been examples of engineered chirality in systems of uh, few superconducting qubits or very recently refer atoms. I will be talking of uh, chirality in quantum gases. And actually, if you think through that, chirality in quantum gases is something really, really old. Uh, it comes from the very beginning of the field. So just shortly after doing the first polyethylene condensates, people put them into rotation and basically did uh, with the condensates what we were seeing uh, with uh, the masses of air in the atmosphere. So basically, you just put into rotation a condensate. Uh, you can create a vortex lattice, but you can also see that the Hamiltonian that describes the system subjected to this Coriolis force is um, equivalent to the one of a particle in a magnetic field. Because indeed, the idea of studying chirality in quantum gases is very linked to the idea of uh, studying artificial gauge fields, so making neutral atoms behave like if they were charged particles. Uh, you can have other methods for engineering such artificial gauge fields. For example, if you put your atoms in an optical lattice and you shake it around, you do some Floquet engineering, you can also get um, particles behave as if they were charged. And we had uh, some very nice uh, talk from Monica Eidelsburger in this uh, VAMOS uh, series not so long ago on this topic. And uh, another method of uh, engineering an artificial gauge field with cold atoms is to use light coupling between different internal states of an atom. And the pioneer person in this field is really Ian Spielman. And you see here beautiful experiments he did where you see cyclotron orbits of um, bosonic atoms subjected to an artificial magnetic field. And when they are on the edge of the system, then they cannot close the cyclotron orbit. So you see some skipping orbits. No? So actually, one thing in common of all these experiments that try to emulate artificial gauge fields with cold atoms is that what you do is that you find your favorite method for engineering a vector potential, A, that you use then to generate a synthetic electric or magnetic field, because basically, if you look at the time derivative of A, you get an electric field, or at the curl, you can generate a magnetic field. And there have been really many, many groups uh, working on this for a long time. Uh, but actually, in all these experiments, what you have is that you uh, engineer with your favorite method a vector potential, and then this vector potential comes in a static way into your um, quantum gas. So it's a static artificial gauge field. And what is much more recent in the field is the effort of doing the opposite, then having matter that backed, acts into the vector potential and modifies it in turn. Yeah? And uh, why would you want to do that, to build some gauge fields that have a back action for matter? Well, you have motivations from high energy physics. Basically, you would like to use quantum gases to emulate the physics of dynamical gauge fields. So you have interactions between particles that can be seen as mediated by um, other particles. Uh, for example, for the electron magnetism uh, by the exchange of photons. And then you can try to build up systems uh, where you have two types of particles. Some play the role of matter and the others of the gauge field. And then the gauge field has some dynamics, the matter has dynamics, and they are both stuff. And this is not easy at all. We also had a nice talk in the VAMOS series uh, from Tilman Esslinger explaining the ETH uh, efforts uh, to do that. And there have been related experiments in uh, Munich and in Heidelberg. And uh, the idea is that uh, these experiments, they are really at the very beginning of getting these uh, dynamical gauge fields. So they engineer building blocks or very simplified uh, schemes to get the back action from matter. What is hard in this case is that not any back action from matter works out, but you need to have your uh, gauge particles that have uh, particular symmetries. For example, I mean, you need to fulfill Gauss law. And this makes it uh, complicated to uh, achieve in the experiment. But uh, physics is not only about high energy physics. There is also condensed matter physics. And in condensed matter physics, we also have uh, density dependent gauge fields, gauge fields uh, with back action from matter. Normally, they are effective theories for more complicated, strongly correlated uh, systems. For example, fractional quantum uh, Hall effect is uh, described with a particular example of density dependent gauge field. And uh, actually, uh, in this case, you don't necessarily need to fulfill the same constraints or the same rules as to uh, simulate a dynamical gauge field. And uh, there has been a nice experiment in the direction of just simulating a density-dependent gauge field in the group of Chengqing. And that's where what we will 
talk about today uh, is about. So in this talk, I will present uh, what I think is the simplest density dependent gauge field that you can make in a cold atom lab, and that has a relevant condensed matter form, let's say, that is relevant to problems in condensed matter. So, as I said, what we want to do is to engineer a gauge field with back action from matter, which is as simple as possible. So for that, we start by generating the simplest possible static gauge field to start with. And for that, we follow the recipe that Ian Spielman has pioneered. So we just take uh, Bose-Einstein condensate uh, with two internal states and we couple them optically. And even though this is a topic which is very well established in the field, uh, because it's very crucial to everything that I will be talking about later, let me just guide you in detail on how these things work. So basically we have a two level atom uh, with uh, two levels that are uh, the spin down and the spin up, and we couple them uh, with lasers in a two photon process. And uh, by doing that, we just transfer uh, momentum to the atom. So when you just flip your spin, you get a momentum kick. So you can see that looking at the dispersion relation of the particles, you have dispersion relation for the uh, up particles or the down particles. And to go from one to the other, then you have to absorb or emit uh, two times uh, the momentum of the Raman lasers. And actually in this problem, it's good to define these quantities, which are the Raman momentum and the characteristic energy associated to it, the recoil energy. So now when you couple these two states with this two photon process, what you have is that these levels hybridize and you get an avoided crossing. Yeah, So you get two dress states and we always focus on the lowest dress state and you see that it's a coherent superposition of the spin down and the spin up. Yeah? Now, if you just increase the strength of your optical coupling uh, that we characterize with a Rabi frequency, then uh, you get uh, at some point a dispersion relation that does not have the funky form that uh, you had before, but just has a single minimum. And if you increase even more the uh, Rabi coupling, then you find that your system behaves very much like a standard atom. Okay, it's in a superposition of up and down, but it just goes to the minimum here, the dispersion, um, it is parabolic. And the only difference is that it has kind of a heavier mass this effective mass and star here, okay? Things get uh, more interesting if you put some detuning uh, of the coupling field such that you don't exactly go, have the energy to go from the up to the down. You have a bit too much or a bit too little because then you can favor either the spin down state or the spin up state. So the dispersion gets a bit uh, biased to one side or to the other side. And what you see is that the minimum of the dispersion is shifted with respect to before and uh, you can describe this system by an effective uh, Hamiltonian that actually looks like this, where you see minimal coupling, you see this P minus A. So basically what you did with this uh, optical coupling is to engineer in a super simple way, this uh, artificial vector potential. And uh, then this vector potential, we can measure directly by seeing how different is the position of the minimum where the atoms are sitting with respect to the one you had if, uh, if we did not have uh, the coupling, and this is uh, what one gets, okay? So as I said, I promise you, we can make vector potentials in a very, very simple way. Now the question is, how do we get back action from matter? So everything I talked about until now uh, concerns single particle physics. Basically, I could have a Bose-Einstein condensate, but I could have a single atom with two levels and everything would have been the same. Actually, the atoms in the bodies and condensate, they interact with scattering lengths A up, A up, up, A down, down, and A up, down. And you see here, if all the scattering lengths are identical, nothing changes, actually. So uh, you, again, can redo the same description that I had before. But if the interactions between uh, the two states and of each state become very different, then things get uh, much richer. And these will be the key ingredients to get back action from matter. Uh, and what you can ask yourself is, in this case, how do these dress state atoms interact? Huh? So let me just uh, do a small discussion uh, and go from optical coupling first to a bit of a simpler situation, which is the situation where you have an RF coupling uh, between the two states. So basically a single photon transition that does not uh, transfer momentum. So in this case, uh, you again have a dress state that is a superposition of down and up uh, with uh, uh, weights of these two states in the coherent superposition that depend on the parameters of the coupling field. 
And now you can imagine that if you have interactions very different between the different states, then uh, when these stress state atoms, these coherent superpositions interact, they will interact with some kind of average of um, the scattering lengths that are involved. Yeah? Actually, this is the expression that they have. And this is a result uh, that is known for quite some time and was uh, indirectly seen by the group of Marcus Obertaler some years ago. So my group, we decided to uh, measure this effective scattering length uh, between uh, dress state atoms uh, directly. So we took potassium-39 in two uh, spin states. This is an experiment that we did last year. And we made very different these three scattering lengths. And what we found is that this effective scattering length depends a lot on the parameters of the coupling field. And it has two asymptotes. And here it can even go to zero or to go, become negative. Actually, we understand this very well. It's because it's just reflecting the composition of the dress states. Because if you look at the composition of the dress states, you see that when you are mostly in spin down, well, you get the interactions of the downs. If you are mostly in spin up, then you get the interactions of the ups. And then when you are in the middle, because we were looking at the configuration where the interactions between up and down were negative and the others were positive, then we could somehow cancel them out. That's why we get effective interactions of these rested atoms that zero. Okay. So these for the simpler case of RF coupling, but what happens when we have optical coupling? So when we have optical coupling, uh, the dress state composition is again as it is depending on uh, this mixing angle theta, but this in turn depends on momentum. It depends on the momentum along the direction of the Raman beams. And actually, these, even when interactions uh, between all the spins are identical, can give uh, some uh, funny uh, consequences. And this is something that uh, Ian Spielman studied some years ago. So if you just smash some uh, Raman coupled atoms with a very large relative momentum against each other, you can create some not only S wave collisions, but also some higher partial ones. This happens if you have very large relative momentum. Um, uh, between the particles involved in a collision, but we are interested uh, right now in a very different case. So the case of very small relative momentum uh, collisions, but with very different uh, scattering lengths. Basically, what we are interested in is what happens when we have a collision between two atoms that then will become again two other dress state atoms, because depending on the momentum of these particles, the spin composition of them can change. And then what we see is that because we are ultra cold, things are uh, really not so complicated because if we have an atomic wave packet moving with some momentum, uh, what happens is that the momentum of each of the particles involved in the collision compared to the center of mass momentum of the atomic wave packet is going to be like not so different. Actually, there is a small parameter in this problem and we can do a serious expansion on the small parameter. And what we find is that the order zero in this parameter uh, the interactions are described as in the RF case, so we have just an effective scattering length. It's just that now it depends basically on the momentum of the center of mass of the atomic wave packet. Uh, but toward order one, there is a correction, and this correction is very interesting because it's linear on this difference of momenta. So it's linear in the difference of momenta between the center of mass of the particles that enter in the collision um, and uh, the center of mass momentum of the wave. Uh, all uh, compared to the momentum and energy scales. Of the and actually, if you put everything together and look at the interaction term, what you find is that you have the standard interaction term that you would have in a VC, but then you have an additional term that depends on this momentum difference, which actually means that it depends on velocity. And uh, the proportionality factor in front of this term goes with the difference of the scattering lengths. So what we are saying is that interactions between the stress state atoms, when the interactions of the up-ups and the down-downs are different, then they depend on velocity. So that also means that the interactions become chiral. That means that you have some kind of interaction momentum locking, depending on at which speed you are moving, then you will have different interactions. And if you are moving in one direction or in the opposite one, you will get different interactions. So what you see is that basically this optically coupled system is a system that really lacks Galilean invariance, but not only at the single particle level, but also at the level of interactions. Okay, then uh, I'm almost done uh, with this. So let's now consider an atomic wave packet. So we can uh, rewrite this product of velocity times density um, as the current operator. 
and then we can rewrite the Hamiltonian in a bit more evocative form. So this is the effective Hamiltonian of the system, which has the kinetic energy part and the interaction part, and in position state space, it has a kinetic term, a standard interaction term, but then it also has this term with these momentum dependent interactions. And uh, let's forget for a moment about this uh, standard interaction term and uh, focus on these kinetic and momentum dependent interactions. What turns out is that you can manipulate this term and to the same order of approximation that we use to derive this uh, expression, then we can combine both of them into a new kinetic energy term. And we can rewrite the Hamiltonian like this, where you have minimal coupling P minus A square over two and uh, star plus an interaction term. Now, what is interesting is that this vector potential that we get is the static vector potential that we started with plus a contribution that depends on density. So we just showed that chiral interactions essentially give you a density dependent vector potential or in other terms that if you have a density dependent vector potential of this structure, that means you have chiral interactions. So the two things are the same. So could we expect that? Actually, yes, because there is another way of looking at the problem. So let's consider that we have these two levels joined by the uh, Raman coupling beams. Now, if we have interactions between the particles, if we have many particles in this state or in this state, then we will have a mean field shift for the spin down atoms and for the spin up atoms, just due to the interactions between atoms in spin down or atoms in spin up. And then what you see is that if we started with a system that had uh, zero uh, detuning, so the two levels, if there were no interactions, they were very well coupled, due to these uh, mean field shifts, if the two scattering lengths are different, then you will get a differential mean field shift and then a detuning that appears and that is density dependent, huh? because this mean field shift depends on density. So you will somehow get a density dependent vector potential. So again, you can write this vector potential as a static part that just comes from the parameters of the lasers that you took initially and a part that depends on the system itself, on its density with this um, proportionality factor here, which again uh, depends on the difference of the scattering. And this is an idea that was put forward uh, by the group of Patrick uh, Oberg quite some years ago. Okay, so this actually, what we showed is that chiral interactions are a different method of getting this result. The nice thing of these chiral interactions for the specialist is that uh, you can find this density dependent vector potential in a much broader parameter regime because you are not linked to the regime of very, very large uh, rabbit coupling, so-called adiabatic transmission. Okay. So what I showed you up to now is that if we have a system with chiral interactions, we have a system that has a density dependent gauge field and vice versa. And I will move on now to show you two uh, important consequences of that. First, the existence of chiral solitons in these systems with chiral interactions. And second, of an asymmetric expansion of the cloud that can be understood as a density dependent. But maybe now that's a good moment uh, to answer questions if you have any. Okay, so um, actually before I get to questions, I'm just gonna briefly let you know, yes, we did succeed in getting this live on YouTube. Um, so uh, I'm happy that that's working. Um, we have a question um, from Junru Lee, which is for the momentum dependent interaction, um, to what extent does it resemble an effective P wave interaction? Mm. Okay, this is a very good question. I don't think it has a symmetry of a P-wave interaction, but uh, I would need to think more about it because this is a term that we are getting already for momenta that are, um, with respect to the center of mass, relative momenta very small, and a P-wave interaction, I would expect we get a centrifugal barrier and we need to have higher momenta, higher relative momenta. So actually what you see is that in Ian Spielman's experiment, in order to get these partial waves, so something that resembles a P or a D or a G wave interaction, you need to put relative momenta of the collision that is very large, and we are not in this limit. But I would need to think further about this question. This is a very interesting question. Okay. Um, so then we have actually maybe a, a pair of questions that I will give you together. 
Um, so Dan Stamper Kern asks, potassium has two different bosonic isotopes, 39 and 41. Why are you choosing to work with potassium 39? Um, and then while I'm at it, just hold that thought, I'm also just going to ask you, Timur Cherubal asks, do you have the ability to control the KK scattering length? Um, and would it be helpful to tune the spin exchange scattering length independently of the up, up, and down, down scattering lengths? So I figure tuning the scattering lengths might be related to the choice of species. So I'll give you both questions at once. Okay, so actually uh, these two questions are my next slide. So maybe I should just show my next slide. Okay. Uh, so potassium indeed has two isotopes and in our machine, uh, we work with both. Uh, it turns out that in potassium 41, um, essentially for almost all conditions, all interactions are always identical. It's uh, very much like rubidium on that. So it's very good to study static uh, gauge fields, whereas in 39, we can have many different uh, two component systems with very different interactions. So that's something that we studied in detail uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and that's why we chose a potassium 39 for the density dependent gauge fields, because we can make these interactions different, but also we can play with them with their sign and so on, which is what I will uh, present later. But it's very nice to have in the same system potassium 41 as a sanity check uh, to make sure that what you are seeing is really an effect of interactions or, and not of something else that you did not understand in the experiment. So we always do experiments with one isotope and the other and compare it. Great. So I think at this point, I'll actually, since you already continued, I'll just let you continue. And then I know you have a second break planned where we'll take more questions. Okay, so then uh, what you are seeing uh, here is our experimental apparatus. I think for, and as I say, it's a pretty standard experiment where the specificity is that we uh, work with these mixtures of BECs, potassium-41, potassium-39. As I explained, potassium-39 is the good isotope uh, for making these measurements. Um, what uh, I can show you is uh, actually we always work with these two states for everything that I will present uh, later, just because there is a good window of parameters where we can play with a scattering length exactly as uh, we want. Um, I can also show you a bit more a schematic view of the experiment. So what you see here is um, the sketch of um, uh, the setup. And what you have is an optical waveguide that confines the atoms radially, whereas we let them move freely uh, along its propagation axis, and two Raman beams which are counter-propagating and superimpose on it. We use the potassium two-node wavelength that's that our Raman beams, they don't make any uh, potential. They just do the Raman coupling. Uh, then you can also see here, we have a high uh, numerical aperture lens uh, to do in situ imaging. We use a scheme using Faraday rotation with a couple of micron resolution typically. And then you see our coils um, uh, here that allow us to adjust interactions uh, using uh, convenient flashback resonances to always try to make this difference very big. And indeed, uh, we use potassium-39 in these two states because on the scale of a bit more than 20 Gauss, we can have the down-down scattering length repulsive and very tunable. Uh, the uh, up-up scattering length, always small, but it can be positive or negative, which is pretty convenient. And then interactions between the two states, uh, they are uh, slightly attractive. But very small. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start uh, seeing what happens if we set uh, opposite sign of the interactions for the up and the down states. So one is uh, repulsive and the other is attractive. Uh, this is basically a typical value that uh, we use. And then what we do is that we prepare our system with these interactions, and then we turn on adiabatically our Raman lasers. Uh, we set up uh, the tuning, which is pretty large, such that we essentially prepare a dry state, which is very close to the down state. And then when we arrive at this stage, then what we do is that we kick the cloud and we can decide if we want to kick it uh, right or left. So we want to give it the velocity in one direction or the other direction to see what happens with its interactions. Yeah? And uh, these we can control by deciding uh, which of these uh, black beams that I put here uh, have um, higher energy or lower energy. Yeah? So we can kick right or we can kick left. And then after that, we just let the atoms expand in the optical waveguide freely. Uh, and then we take an image in situ inside the optical. So let's first check what happens when we propagate right. So we kick the atoms um, uh, to the right uh, side. And then we just remove the confinement. So what we see is that the atoms over time just expand. Yeah? And this is something that we would expect because 
um, the system to first order has a repulsive interaction there, has about 20 a not uh, scattering length. Uh, so it's just behaving like this. But what happens if we kick uh, left? Well, then when we do that, what happens is uh, very different. So what we see is that the system remains without expanding for all the times we look at. We can actually look for longer because it's not expanding, so it remains tense. And actually, uh, this absence of expansion we trace to the fact that we are creating a system with attractive interactions, uh, and in these optical waveguides, is forming a bright solid. Uh, basically, we have attractive uh, interactions that hold the particles together, but this is compensated uh, by the repulsive effect of quantum pressure, such that we have a self-bound state that is formed. So you see, we have a system that we start at some point. If we kick it right, it behaves like a gas. If we kick it left, it behaves like a soliton. So it's a chiral system because left and right propagation directions are very different. Okay, we can also make things a bit more quantitative and look at the size of the cloud over time. And we see if we kick right, it increases. If we kick left, it's positive. Okay, so our system is described by this Hamiltonian that I derived before and explained you before. And what is funky in this Hamiltonian is this term, which are our uh, momentum uh, dependent interactions, so this current term that is in here. Now, you could wonder, because at the beginning I told you, well, we will make a gauge field that has back action from matter, but it's of some relevant form in condensed matter. Is this Hamiltonian interesting or not? Or is it just the one we are making because that's what our system makes and that's it? Well, it turns out that this is a Hamiltonian that's quite studied in literature. Uh, there is, for example, this nice uh, paper here that uh, studies it in detail. Um, and if you read this paper, okay, it's not an easy, easy paper. Uh, you find sentences that say things like, okay, this Hamiltonian describes matter coupled to a chern simons field dimensionally reduced to one. So you wonder why these people, because this is just one example that Roman Jakiv, for example, he wrote several papers on that, why they bother about this model. So, that's when you go to your theory friends and discuss with them and they explain you what each of these buzzwords means. So basically what they tell you is, okay, the churn simons field, this is an effective model that you normally use to describe fractional quantum whole systems. So it's an effective gauge theory for this system because basically if you have electrons in a, in a, in a 2D uh, fractional quantum whole system, so they interact strongly between them, there is this strong magnetic field. It's all very complicated to understand, but you can build a much simpler theory, uh, supposing that your electrons are just getting each of them a flux tube attached to them. So there is this magic gauge field, this churn simons field that corresponds to these flux tubes. And then these electrons attached with these flux tubes that are behaving with these anionic statistics. And then you have a simpler model that describes your system. So basically this barbarous sentence here, what says is that basically uh, you take an effective theory that is standard for fractional quantum pulse systems, describes the excitations in fractional quantum pulse system, and you see what happens to this theory when you go from 2D to 1D. And this is what this Hamiltonian describes. And people try to study that quite a bit because they wanted to see whether anions that you have in 2D systems, they still exist when you go to 1D. And the conclusion of this paper is that with exactly this form, this is not the case, but you get uh, something new, which are uh, novel chiral and then you see uh, this model, what it describes is simplest density dependent gauge field uh, that we can think that has some condensed matter relevant uh, for. Huh? Okay, so when we saw uh, this sentence about these uh, chiral solitons, we wonder whether what we are seeing that we have these wave packets that propagate without dispersion when we kick left and not right are not exactly these chiral solitons and whether we can say more about what makes these chiral solitons different from standard bright solitons that we are used to see in quantum gases. And uh, we ask ourselves the question, how to distinguish chiral solitons from standard solitons? Huh? So what happens if we create a wave packet in an optical waveguide and it propagates without uh, expansion when we move in one direction, how do we see it's chiral or it's standard? So it's actually very simple. What you need to do is that you build a wall and you make it bounce off a wall and you see what happens. Uh, and if uh, you have a conventional soliton, it will remain a soliton. And if you have a chiral soliton, something will, will happen strange. Huh? So we decided to build the experiment. So we built a wall with a repulsive uh, Gaussian beam. 
focused here. And then we made first for sanity check a standard soliton with potassium 39 in this state, uh, just uh, with a similar uh, uh, scattering length. And we launch it left with a, with a bright kick. And what we see is here, is, uh, here. so you take uh, this soliton, you create it, you, you kick it left, so it starts moving in this direction. The barrier is this gray line, so when it arrives to the barrier, it bounces off, but you see that it bounces, but it remains being a solid. Now, what happens with the chiral solid or with the object that we saw that was making the solid in our uh, Raman couple system? So just, uh, I was forgetting, here you see uh, the size of the standard solid in this case. So for the chiral soliton, we do the same. We have this soliton, it starts propagating, it reaches the wall, it bounces off. And then what you see is that it disappears basically. It starts expanding at the beginning little and then it becomes bigger and bigger. So you have the chiral soliton that cannot stand this bouncing off the wall and starts uh, propagating, so expanding and converting into this. So we can see things a bit more clearly if we look at the size of our solitons normalized by their initial size over time. So the gray line is when we reach the barrier and we see that when they arrive to the barrier, both compress a little bit. Now, this you can also see in the images, but afterwards the standard soliton just remains bound, whereas a chiral soliton only exists when propagating in one direction and not in the other. So it is a space. So you have this collective state of all atoms that go into the soliton that only exist when going in that direction. Okay, so this uh, could be a good time to uh, answer questions if there are any, otherwise I can just finish. So um, we have a question from John Simon who asks, what are the laws of reflection off of a barrier in a chiral system? Does P become minus P or something else? Okay, so what we see is that we conserve energy. Yeah? So this is, uh, I mean, we can, uh, I have some slides that I can uh, check uh, later. Mm -hmm. so we see, for example, here, things that happen. So we have a given uh, position over time, and then uh, we can do that for a standard soliton and for a chiral soliton. And uh, it seems to be consistent with conserving energy when we the, bounce. Off. The velocity need not be the same in the two directions, in other words. Yeah, yeah, it's not the same. So we have another question from Trevor Wright, who asks, have you taken any data with a chiral soliton bouncing off a wall, but one where it's expanding before it hits the wall and should remain at a constant size after? Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat it again? Um, so uh, the question is um, essentially whether if, uh, so, okay, so, so it's phrased as, have you taken any data with a chiral soliton bouncing off a wall, but one where it's expanding before it hits the wall and should remain at a constant size after? Um, maybe another way to phrase it is, is there- Something yeah. expanding, so it's not a soliton a gas, and then when it reaches the wall, it would bound into a soliton. So we did not try because we think if we do that, then the density will go very low. And then we still need to gather all the atoms together. I think eventually they will just get together and bind it to a soliton if we do this experiment. But it might take some time, yeah, because uh, I mean it's already a pretty dilute system, so you really need to refocus basically everything together to bind bind the soliton. And these solitons with so little attraction, they are I mean, a bit touchy to create. I mean, if you put a bit too many excitations in there, they already dissociate. So I think experimentally it would be tricky, but in principle, it should happen. Okay, so um, then we have a question from David Weiss, who asks, does the chiral soliton shrink as it approaches the wall? So we see both solitons shrinking when they approach the wall, so we excite somehow a mode on the soliton, so it breathes a bit, it gets smaller, but then this is what you are seeing here, the standard soliton shrinks and then it increases and then it stays stable. Whereas uh, the other one, once it starts expanding, it keeps expanding. Okay, we excite some mode, so we can see it like expanding and breathing a bit, but it continuously grows. And this is actually what you expect. Uh, I don't think this compressing and re-increasing is special 
of the chiral soliton. You see the standard soliton does it the same, but also if we do some GPE simulations, this is exactly what we expect. Okay, so that may somewhat answer another question that's here, but I'll just ask it so you can answer it explicitly. So Nathan Schein asks, is the velocity not being the same in the two directions linked to the chiral soliton appearing to compress more while bouncing off the wall? Mm, the the velocity compress more than the standard soliton. Directions, I would say it's due to the modified dispersion uh, relation that uh, we have in the Raman couple system a different first derivative of the energy with k than in the non Raman couple system. It is on the same spirit as we have different effective mass when we uh, go in the Raman couple system with respect to uh, Great. So, with that, um, I will let you keep um, pushing ahead and save remaining questions till the end. Okay. So, then I'm uh, just coming to the last uh, part of my talk. So I showed you that chiral interactions, they can give you chiral solitons. Now, now uh, I also told you that chiral interactions and density dependent gauge fields, they are equivalent, but we would like to observe this uh, density dependent gauge field in some more direct way, maybe, not just the chiral soliton. So if we want to do that, I told you at the very beginning that basically when you get a vector potential, uh, then depending on what its time derivative or its curl is, then you can get a magnetic field or an electric field. So our idea to see a density dependent gauge field uh, is to actually see what happens when we change it over time. So try to make a density dependent electric field. And this is a smart thing we think because the electric field is just uh, uh, the derivative of A over time. Uh, and A, we know it has a static part and a density dependent part. So if we don't change the parameters of the static field, um, we can just get rid of this effect, basically, and see uh, what happens when we change density to the electric field. So it's a way of kind of dissociating the static part from the density dependent uh, part of the vector. And now if you have a... Uh, uh, condensate system, what's the best way of changing the density over time by a lot is actually to let the cloud expand, yeah? because that makes uh, the density drop dramatically. So what we want to do is to change the density of the cloud by expansion and see how the change in the density dependent vector potential gives an electric field and should give some macroscopic consequence on the dynamics. Yeah? And actually, uh, what do you expect to have? So if you do that at t equals zero, you would have a wave packet, which depending uh, on which side you are, it's a bit more up or a bit uh, more down. And now when you let it expand, if you just think microscopically, if A down down, so the green atoms, they interact much more repulsively than the up ones, then you would expect that these ones are expanding faster than this one. So you would get uh, this type of asymmetric shape. Yeah? But actually you can formulate everything in terms of this, uh, uh, density dependent electric field. And you would find that when you let the cloud expand and the density drops and the drop in density is not the same uh, here, for example, than here. So actually you will get an electric force that is different in this part of the cloud than in this one. And uh, this will distort also the shape of your cloud. And you really get the uh, same consequences that you just think microscopically like this or that you go through this uh, density dependent. So we decided to do the experiment. So basically we prepared in the same way, adiabatically the system and so on, and then let it expand without kicking it. And what we see is the following. So we wait over time and we see that we start with something that is symmetric and as time goes on, then it starts to become very, very asymmetric. Profile exactly as what we were expecting. And for doing this, uh, just to answer the questions from the beginning, we really take very, very asymmetric interactions between the up and the down spins, but everything is repulsive. So if this is really expanding in all directions, just one is expanding way more than the other. So now when we saw this, initially we were very uh, happy, the students were very happy in the lab, but uh, then at some point we started wondering whether it was clear that this could only come from a density dependent electric field and not from something else. And why we started wondering is because there are these very nice experiments uh, from the group of uh, Peter Engels that see such shapes of the cloud after expansion uh, in a system that does not have any density dependent uh, vector potential. They use rubidium, they let it expand with Raman coupling, 
and they see that the cloud becomes asymmetric. And actually, uh, the explanation for their experiments is what they call negative effective mass. It's sketched here. So you have your BC, you let it expand. And at some point, you see that the curvature of the dispersion can be very different in one direction than in the other. Yeah? In their case, this becomes dramatic because they uh, get this um, second derivative with respect to the momentum of the energy, uh, which is uh, one over the effective mass, basically. That goes negative. So that's why there is this sharp edge here. So then we wonder, OK, how can we be sure that what we see is an effect of interactions and not an effective mass? It's because what it would do in our case is that it could also give us some asymmetry. So let's imagine we take between 0. This is the effective uh, mass uh, profile that we get. OK, so if we put ourselves somewhere here, then I mean, atoms that want to expand in this direction, OK, they have small mass, so they will expand nicely. But if they need to expand in this direction, I mean, will be harder because they are heavier. Yeah? So you can get some asymmetric. But you also see immediately from this uh, type of image that if you put yourself just on the top of the hill of the effective mass, then the effects are symmetric. So you should cancel this. Yeah? So basically, what it means is that actually you can formulate things more generally, that you can always avoid these uh, single particle uh, sources of asymmetry, this effective mass asymmetry, by uh, making uh, Raman coupled system that has equal weights of spin up and spin down. Yeah? So if you have zero detuning is by going to momentum zero for your uh, uh, wave packet. But if you have a different detuning, there is just a good momentum that always does. Yeah? So basically, the data that I showed you here, it was well taken because we were in the good condition. And we um, indeed see that there is an asymmetry of the cloud that develops over time of propagation in the waveguide. And it was done in the good way because the effective mass effect was basically present. But of course, we can do things differently. So we can put a detuning, um, which is negative, for example. And here, the effects of the density dependent electric field and of the effective mass would add up. So we get something more asymmetric. And um, if uh, we, on the contrary, go to the opposite direction, so we can go to a configuration where the two effects have opposite signs and they cancel out, and we indeed see them canceling out exactly as we would. And uh, Dan was asking, why uh, don't we use potassium-41? Actually, we can redo exactly the same experiments with potassium-41. This is what was running uh, in the lab uh, today during the day, for example, to just do more uh, cross-checks. And actually, you see that this effect is gone, and you only have the effective mass effect. So you just get something flat one direction, the other direction. So we really see that potassium-39 behaves very differently because it has this density-dependent electric field. Uh, that comes from the density dependent. OK, so with this, I really come uh, to the uh, end of my talk. So what I was uh, showing you today is that we can engineer a system with chiral interactions by combining Raman coupling and uh, tunable interactions in the same system in potassium-39. Uh, this uh, system with chiral interactions is equivalent to realizing a density dependent gauge field, so a gauge field that has back action uh, from matter, and we studied two uh, uh, important manifestations of that. First, the existence of chiral solitons, so self-bound states that only exist when propagating in one direction. So when you bounce them off a wall, they don't exist anymore. And an asymmetric expansion of uh, the cloud when you release it in an optical waveguide due to the existence of a density dependent electric force. And now what uh, should we do next? So well. Everything we did now is on a weakly interacting limit. But in principle, all the derivation that we did is just for field operators, basically. So it's directly generalizable to a strongly interacting systems. So we could go to uh, one dimension uh, to get strong interactions with this density uh, dependent vector potential, or do the same in an optical lattice. And we are also discussing um, quite a bit with a group of Patrick Obert, because it turns out that actually it's funny because these chiral condensates, they have physics which is very reminiscent of physics of the edges of a fractional quantum Hall system. Actually, all the phenomenology is uh, the same. So we could do experiments on hydrodynamics with uh, these uh, chiral interactions and then uh, this uh, chiral condensate. And uh, they also have ideas to extend this scheme to 2D systems, to, so to really get what they call synthetic flux attachment, so really to get a real uh, churn Simons theory that would be then the effective theory of uh, these fractional quantum hall systems. And uh, with this, 
I want to finish by uh, thanking my group. So the people that did these experiments are these two very smart PhD students, Craig uh, Chisholm and Annika Tholian. Um, and they worked together with three uh, great postdocs. So at the beginning of the project, together with Cesar Cabrera before he moved uh, to Munich. And then over the last year, uh, Ramon Ramos and Eletna Neri uh, joined us. So really these are the people doing the work in the lab. Uh, and uh, we had a really nice uh, theory collaboration with Alessio Celli, who was the person formalizing all these hand-waving ideas. We had that chiral interactions need to be somehow the same as density-dependent gauge field, but we were just formulating it the experimental hand-wavy way, and he just made the consistent theory connections. Uh, I want to thank also a few other people. So Julio Sant is a former PhD student in my group that got all this interaction control with uh, radio frequency fields uh, working that was important for getting uh, this project done. And then the blue guys here, Jonathan Hoshele, Vasily Makhalov, and Sandra Buov, they are the people working on our uh, strontium uh, lattice project. And then uh, I thank our theory friends in Edinburgh, Barcelona, Hanover, and Vilnius for many discussions, and you for your attention. Thank you for a wonderful talk. We have a couple more questions. Um, so Adam uh, Kaufman asks, have you had any heating issues from the Raman beams that depend on the presence of interactions? Okay, so this is a very good question. So we have issues of heating with the Raman beams because of photon scattering, because it's only one nanometer from the D1 line of potassium. Um, and at least we could live with very well with potassium 41 because um, because uh, it does not have this back action from matter. With potassium-39, things become tricky because also preparing adiabatically the ground state before doing all this kicking and so on is hard because there is always back action. So you really, we wanted to see a gauge field with back action from uh, matter, but actually this back action is drastic. So each time you change a parameter, like you ramp the rubbish frequency or you ramp the detuning, you have to be super careful how you do that because otherwise you get breathing oscillations of your cloud or so. So I would not say it's heating issues, but it makes all the experimental timescales to prepare some meaningful state longer because all the things are all the time interacting one with the other. But on the other hand, that's what you want to do if you want to engage with back action, right? So it's a bit intrinsic to the problem. So um, let's see, there's a comment from Dan Snapperkern. Dan, do you want to make your own comment since you're here? Leticia, we just finished up an experiment where we were looking at uh, band structure renormalization. So when you have atoms that move in a lattice, they uh, occupy the sites of a lattice in the way that changes the lattice potential. And that leads to a dispersion relation that depends on atomic density. So how many of the effects we're looking at here would be reproduced in that kind of setup? I realize we don't have the same uh, sort of built-in chirality of your uh, experiment, but I presume like in a moving lattice, that chirality would also be uh, present. So it's hard to say like this because of course, I mean, one needs to write the equations. I think what is nice or specific in our system is that this correction that we have to the interactions is not of any form. It has this very particular form, uh, which is proportional to velocity and density that makes appear this current term. Now in your system, I don't know how you would get that. Maybe if you have a moving lattice or so, because otherwise it's not going to have this breaking of the symmetry, right? So I would say, I mean, somehow I always still find it magic that you do the calculation and you do this Taylor expansion and it comes up exactly in the form that it should. But I don't think that in general, you can have this uh, density changes the dispersion relation, but it will do it in any way, I think. Our conclusion at the end is that here it does it in a in a nice way by chance. I mean, nature does it. Huh? But if you start breaking the symmetry by moving the lattice, then I don't. Know. When would need to write uh, the collision problem? Yeah. Great, so um, we have now a question from Wolfgang Ketterle who asks, um, I assume you can have density dependent gauge fields in a single component system. So when does a density dependent gauge field correspond to chiral interactions? Okay, uh, in our system, it is the same because basically in our system, 
its uh, two components. Huh? Um, so I would not see how you make the density dependent in the single component system. So I get the point. So we say chiral interactions is the same as the density dependent gauge field in our two component system. I don't think it's a generic statement. Uh, if I have another mechanism that makes this uh, density dependent gauge field. I think it's specific to this type of symmetry that we have for the gauge field. So I would think it goes in the direction of Dan's question. So what makes that we get this magic form that this correction has just the form we want in the form of a current? It's because uh, we have these two component system with the different interactions. Now you can have a different form of density dependent gauge field, um, which will have a different symmetry and so on, and it will not be linked to chiral interactions. So I, I think these chiral interactions, they link to a, to a structure of the gauge field. Great. Um, and let's see, I'll end with one question from John Simon who asks, a density dependent velocity gives rise to shock waves, for example, in the Burgers equation. Is there a way to get a shock wave in your system? Yes, so I was uh, mentioning super shortly. Um, actually, there was this idea of doing hydrodynamics on the chiral system. And uh, uh, this is something that um, uh, Gerard Valenti uh, is doing as a PhD student in the group of uh, Patrick Oberg. So we were discussing quite a bit with them because you have shock waves that are unconventional because of the chirality and so on. Actually, I have to say, uh, I want to mention a paper from uh, Peter Engels, very recent. I think it came out also during the lockdown times where they studied these things due to their negative effective mass. Uh, but they are things that will be different basically because of the chiral interactions compared to what uh, Peter sees with the uh, negative effective mass. Great. So with that, um, let's see. I think we should, first of all, thank Leticia once again for a great talk. And there will be a discussion afterwards. Um, so the, the link is already in the Q&A for the um, post-talk discussion with Leticia. But before you head over there, um, if you'll sh stop sharing your screen, um, I will quickly um, put up next week's program. Great, so um, next week, uh, the Virtual AMO seminar on Friday will be Andrew Daly from Strathclyde, who will tell us about exploring dissipative many body dynamics with cold atoms. And our sister series, um, the quantum science seminar on Thursday, will feature Misha Lukin, who will talk about programmable quantum systems based on Rydberg atom arrays. Um, so see you there next week or see you right now in the post seminar discussion with Leticia. All right, so, so Leticia, you could see the, the um, Zoom invitation in the bottom of your chat. Uh, mm, yeah. Okay, so it's the, the link here, right? Yep. Just... Yeah, and then you see there's a passcode chiral that will take. But the password is embedded in the link, actually. So. Yeah, I just did it there just in case. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to miss that discussion. So, Leticia, it was good seeing you and uh, hope to see you. For real sometime. For real sometime, all of us. <laughs> you had to come to swim, yeah? You yeah. remember that? Oh, yes, right. Oh, are you Next talking time. in San Filiu? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, when are we swimming, Leticia? <laughs> well, I mean, I go swimming every day, yeah? It's the only Barcelona thing. is a good place for it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, we should probably head over to the other room because people. Yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting because I'm the host. So go ahead. I'll, I'll just wait to okay, make sure. Go ahead. Over there. I'm in both. I'm, I'm going to the other room.